All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to StatTech Research's seminar series on measuring progress and well-being. In case this is your first time, I am Kelsey O'Connor, one of the organizers. Today, we have a special seminar with Professor Joe Sergi and Richard Estes, professors, uh, who will take us through the history of social indicators, research, and quality of life metrics. As we have two speakers, we have extended the seminar to last an hour and a half in total. Joe and Richard will speak for approximately one hour, then we will have 30 minutes for questions, at which time please raise your virtual hands or post your questions in the chat. During the presentation, please keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off uh, to save bandwidth. Um, and a last reminder, we are recording the event. You will, be, you will be able to find this and past recordings on the website and our YouTube channel. Uh, I'll put our website and YouTube channel in the chat uh, for those of you who are new. Uh, now to introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Joseph Sergi is an Emeritus Professor of Marketing at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, an extraordinary professor at the Workwell Research Unit at Northwest University in South Africa. He is a management psychologist by training who has published extensively in the area of marketing, business ethics, and quality of life. He co-founded the journal Applied Research and Quality of Life, is currently serving as editor-in-chief at the Journal of Macro Marketing and is co-editor of the Springer book series on human well-being and policymaking. This is just a brief bio. Uh, you can see more, of course, uh, online. Uh, just to spare you all the details, uh, we couldn't go through the, the extensive list of uh, publications, etc., uh, for either speaker. And uh, Dr. Richard Estes is Emeritus Professor of Social Work and Social Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. He work, has worked extensively on international social work and comparative social development. Numerous awards and grants, including three Fulbrights, facilitated work in Iran, Norway, and South Korea, among others. He's held professorships in another nine countries, including, for instance, Belgium, Russia, and Mexico. In 2014, Richard was inducted into the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, the leading professional honorific organization for social welfare in the United States. For me, it is a great pleasure to host Joe and Richard as two prominent members of the International Society for Quality of Life Studies, also known as ISQALS, an organization that helped start my career. Joe founded ISQALS, co-founded ISQALS, and Richard is a former president. Without further ado, we are pleased to welcome Professor Joe Sergi and Professor Richard Estes. Joe, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Kelsey. Um, that's a very nice introduction. Um, We're going to start with uh, with Richard um, doing a narration uh, of the history of social indicators. Uh, say something about Richard. Richard is uh, not only a good friend and a colleague, and a, well, he's a wonderful scholar. And one of the things that um, he's very famous for is his uh, weighted uh, index of social um, progress. Um, for those of you who might be interested in, in the measurement of quality of life at the, at the national level, I urge you to um, attend the next webinar, which is, uh, which is going to be hosted by ISCOLS, yeah. but it's, it's not scheduled yet. It's supposed to, se it's supposed mal, to be se announced. Se... It's supposed to be announced sometime next week. Uh, and in, in the context of that webinar, um, again, um, Richard Estes will be talking about the history of that, that index. It dates back all the way to 1970s. So he's got something like 50 years of data uh, on, on social indicators and, and quality of life uh, of a whole bunch of countries, as in fact, the, all the countries in the world, <laughs> at least um, those countries that that we have data from. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I uh, I will turn it over to uh, Richard, and he will take the floor. Richard, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I'm I feel very privileged to be uh, participating in a seminar um, with so many uh, eminent scholars from various parts of uh, the world participating. What I'm going to do is read from a manuscript, which I will readily make available to each of you if you simply send me an email. And I know Kelsey will provide email addresses 
and I'll be uh, glad to do that. In fact, I could send it to Kelsey and Kelsey could distribute it, Wh whatever makes the most sense. So, but I, since it, we are dealing with history, I want to work from the script because there are many names that have to be uh, mentioned. First of all, I want to talk about the early years of, of um, the social indicators movement. Generally, we think of it as beginning in the 1960s, maybe 70s, certainly by the 80s, we had a major movement in Europe and in the United States with social indicators. But in fact, social indicators go back well before uh, the, that pe this period of uh, organized activity of an interdisciplinary nature. In social work, it began as early as 1917 uh, with the publication of various books. And I'm going to start uh, with that discussion. And I'm going to talk about community. When I use the word community, community you can think of as a very large concept. Community can be local, it can be uh, regional, it can be national, it can be international. Um, but community is the frame of reference that uh, all people in the social indicators movement, even from the uh, early part of the last century, uh, were concerned with. So knowledge-based intervention has been a hallmark of local, national, and international practice since the turn of the century. Indeed, the social survey and charity organization movements of the 1900s in the United States were a direct outgrowth of efforts on the part of applied social scientists to do two, three things, to identify the nature, extent, and severity of new and emerging social needs in their communities, then to organize people and institutions uh, to respond to those needs that were identified. And you always, it was always a subset of organizations related to different needs. And the third was to establish baseline measures against which interventions, uh, successes and failures could be assessed. And the names that uh, some of you may be familiar with, but probably many are not, are Harry Bartlett, who, wrote a wonderful book on the social survey movement uh, in 1928. Uh, Mary Richmond's social diagnosis, which dealt with uh, families in need in urban areas, uh, was 1917. And Sidney Zibelness summarized the historic themes uh, about social indicators and what came from the survey movement in 1977. That's a wonderful book to pick up and read and see um, what it is that uh, our, the people who, on whose shoulders we all stand um, really were struggling with at the time. They even renamed the journal, which they were publishing their reports in, from Charities and the Common Good to the survey, just to give you an idea, uh, because they were conducting door-to-door -door and community-to-community -community surveys of various social needs that existed. And the survey published from 1897 to 1952, just to give you a sense of the spread of this. And many of the papers published in the survey sound very co contemporary to us. In fact, the titles could almost be the same in some cases. It's just dealing with different periods and different actors and, you know, obviously different levels of need and so on. The um, stated purpose of the survey, the journal itself, I'm going to read that because it's again, it's going to sound very familiar with what we're dealing with today, just to show the continuity of the past to the present. It says that as a journal, we chronicle developments. We pull experiments and experience. We afford a forum for free discussion. And we carry forward swift firsthand investigations with a procedure comparable to that of scientific research. And these were the early social scientists. We interpret the findings of others, and we employ photographs, maps, charts, and the arts in gaining a hearing from two to 20 times that of formal books and reports. That's the origins of the GIS movement, uh, because they were in fact plotting uh, the incidence of poverty, of various diseases, and so on. And the maps are really quite striking in terms of the similarity uh, between what they were doing as early as 1917 with uh, a contemporary GIS uh, graphic uh, information systems movement. So as I say, Mary Richmond's work um, was an important one to look at, where you can see similarities in the past and the present today, 
is in the Community Indicators Consortium, which is a very important uh, organization uh, for us. And I referenced the year 2010 because that's where I cut off my historical piece. Uh, works by Baskin and Binnis, uh, Bins uh, is very significant as well. Environment Canada, which I think if um, Alex Miklos comes on um, to the seminar, uh, he can talk about Environment Canada. Hong and Fong in um, Hong Kong also provided a, both a theoretical and conceptual base for constructing social indicators within the city state of, uh, of the city state of uh, Hong Kong. And then there are others that I mentioned here as well. Social indicators, social reporting, and the development of composite measures of social progress have a long history in both Europe and America among the uh, applied social scientists. And of course, as we know, that's a very large interdisciplinary group of, uh, of researchers. In the US, the earliest efforts in all three fields began initially as part of what was known as the Hoover Commission. And the Hoover Commission formed a committee on social trends and continued as part of the efforts to assess the impact of the space program, the American space program on American society. Now that may sound very odd to you, but uh, enormous amounts of money and training were invested in the society with respect to our space program. And of course, it proved tremendously successful. Um, but we want to know what the impact of that was on American society, particularly if we got into space and found there were other people there to welcome us. That would have been quite a, uh, a, a surprising event, I think, for all of us. Uh, at the same time, President Johnson initiated uh, what's called the Great Society Initiatives of the 1960s. And with it, he wanted tightly focused emphasis on five great national goals, very goal-oriented uh, uh, program with strong social indicators to determine both success and failure with respect to the attainment of these goals and link the goals and uh, processes of national development to specific measurable outcomes. One of the earliest contributions to the development of a coherent conceptual framework for the emerging social indicator movement was that made by Raymond Bauer, 1966. I suspect almost everyone who attends the seminar may have a copy of Raymond Bauer's book on, uh, in their collection. Of course, it was called Social Indicators, and it was put together by a whole group of uh, scholars of various disciplines um, who spoke to the issue of how you measure society objectively. Bauer offered a comprehensive framework for integrating analysis, which until that time largely had been undertaken in isolation from one another. That is trend analysis of changes over time in the health, education, transportation, housing, labor, urban development, and other sectors of public activity. At the same time, another very prominent sociologist came on the scene with the same level of concern. And this was Daniel Bell, who in the same year, 1966, published Toward a Social Report. And I would guess almost certainly Kelsey the library of your institute, you will find a copy of Toward a Social Report along with Social Indicators. And uh, Bell laid out the conceptual framework for undertaking analysis of relevance of policymakers concerning national and local trends in social development. Uh, back in the United States, again, Wilbur Cohn, who was a um, advisor, secretary of health and welfare for um, the president, um, insisted on the use of social indicators in uh, programs that were funded by the central government. And as you all know, the US is an extraordinarily large country and very diverse country. And he wanted a set of unified indicators to really measure the impact of the investments that were being made in those societies. Uh, that was done in 1969. At the same time, there was another very prominent uh, person who was put in charge of the Department of Defense, and that was Robert McNamara. He was former president of the Ford Foundation. McNamara, McNamara brought a business acumen with him to the Department of Defense, and again, built in uh, a goal-oriented approach to planning, insisted on cost-benefit analysis, 
fiscal management, and task-centered approaches to planning in the Department of Defense. So you see these are very significant breakthroughs in terms of the use of, so, of so, one conceptualized social indicators and then applying them to major national activities. Other pioneers in these movements included Donald McGranahan, an, an economist, who in 1972, working with the United Nations Research Institute on Social Development, created a system of statistical congruences for identifying the discrete stages to which poor countries could move in achieving progressively higher levels of social and economic development. And he was able to create these categories um, showing the, I would say, the linear nature of development, which is what economists typically would do. But it, it was a very uh, significant uh, contribution conceptually. Then came, for the first time in the history, and Joe, you may want to elaborate on this or even correct me, uh, the first time that subjective social indicators came into being uh, on the scene, in the context that I'm, I'm discussing, was the publication by Campbell, Converse, and Rogers in 1976. They introduced qualitative assessments to the quality of life. This was a book that collected various instruments that were used to measure happiness, well-being, um, state of mind of people uh, using various survey technologies, uh, taking snapshots of people's feelings at particular moments in time, very significant contribution to the social indicators movement and putting in place the uh, happiness, subjective happiness concept. So uh, Daniel Bell, uh, my work, the work by Ken Land and Spillerman, David uh, or Mars, David Mars, some of you may know, 1977, Streeton in 1981, all picked up on that theme and incorporated into their research. Although most of the names I just mentioned were scholars who continued to be primarily in the quantitative camp rather than the qualitative camp. At the same time, work on the development of social indicators and national systems of social reporting was accelerating in both the United States and Europe. Notable among these additional efforts was the emergence of the index construction movement. And that was led by an economist, Jen Drunowski and Scott Wolf, with the creation of the Level of Living Index, which uh, some of you may know about, others may not. And they published a number of um, works on behalf of uh, the UN um, Social Development Group. Uh, and they're really quite interesting uh, what it is that uh, they came up with particularly in terms of the methodology of, uh, of analysis of well-being. One of the early accomplishments uh, within the United Nations was the creation of what was to become a vast, accessible, national, international statistical library of data relevant for social indicators. When I entered the field, it was pretty early on, I'm not going to give the year for it, um, there were very few social indicators available. There was great wealth of economic measures. There were very, there was very little social, and social, very few social measures, and certainly nothing to do with subjective happiness. That was almost uh, non-existent. But over time, we got the libraries, uh, not the libraries, the organizations, to begin to collect uh, increasingly relevant data, which uh, they knew they needed, and we certainly knew was needed to do the kind of work that we were being asked to do. This whole thing. Richard, yes. if, if I may, um, that's, I feel like a perfect time where you can distinguish the economic indicators from the social indicators. Just a couple of examples. Some of the audience, I think, are not necessarily familiar um, with this uh, broad movement at all, let's say. So uh -huh. a, a, couple, a couple of examples and maybe a definition, I think, um, especially to distinguish between the economic and the social would be helpful. Economic uh, measures always have been and continue to be about GDP and variations of GDP. That is the national net wealth of the, the country. The assumption behind the economic indicators, or the collection of these economic indicators and in measuring the well-being of society, the assumption was that if the more money people had in their pocket, the better off they would be. They would feel better. They would be able to consume at a higher rate. 
and everything would just go along in a, a very positive um, way, positive direction. That turned out not to be the case. There was a uh, United Nations, as some of you may likely not know, um, is the United Nations has development decades. The first development decade was devoted entirely to economic development. And after 10 years of hard work in promoting economic growth within societies, it turned out that it did not succeed at all in improving the quality of life and well being of people. Yes, some became very rich, societies became better off. There was more physical infrastructure and so on uh, achieved, and those were all positives, but it did not trickle down in a sense to people for them to feel sufficiently satisfied that changes were taking place in the quality of their life. That's where the social indi indicators came in. But if, for example, in the health area, the infant mortality rates we know to be very important measures of um, the quality of a health system and of course the impact of a good health system versus a not so good health system on the well-being of families, particularly if they were losing children. And in 1917, 1920s, I would say the average family size was five to seven children in the US. Certainly two to three of those children did not survive into adulthood. So that death of children uh, was very common. And so we knew we needed reliable measures of infant mortality and child mortality as direct measures of those phenomena, but also as indirect measures of the quality of the health systems. Because social indicators perform two functions in that regard. They measure directly what it is they say they're going to measure, infant mortality, but infant mortality in turn gets to be an indirect measure of the quality of the health system or services that are extended to people. So, and there are a lot of things in the housing area, in the um, transportation area, uh, as well as in the educational arena, uh, even in the business area, uh, all of which turn, are in the social realm that turn out to be extremely important to people, in many ways, even more important than the economic, although we recognize that both have to go hand in hand together. One does, you, you cannot do the social, you cannot achieve social progress without economic growth. On the other hand, economic growth is really not the answer to all social problems. If they were, you wouldn't have societies like the United States with high rates of poverty and homelessness and all the things that uh, we have to confront, the crime rates and so on. Uh, because in uh, the US, money is not the issue. Uh, we have plenty of money to solve these problems. But um, the ideology is such that we're not willing to make those investments. Europe, European society since the war years has been willing to do that. So that financial poverty, income poverty, turns out to be relatively low at this point. But many of the social indicators are extremely high. And being able to measure the distinction between those is very relevant. Uh, does that clarify it a little bit, Kelsey? Uh, yes, very much. Thanks. Sure. Um, you know, that suggests to me that um, well, I was going to do something different, but let me talk about uh, another group that became very important because I recognize that I'm going to run out of time. I don't want to infringe on Joe. A group that was very influential to me uh, as I was entering the field was is known as the Club of Rome. And I assume most people in the audience do not know anything about the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome was founded in 1968 by Aurelio Pecci. Pecci was the um, managing director of Fiat and Olivetti. Olivetti, of course, was known for typewriters, but they made many, many other things as well and continue to make many other things. Pecci brought his, again, business skills, managerial skills, together with Alexander King, who was the director general for scientific affairs of the OECD. Uh, in Paris, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And they formed a very small, very select group of people from various fields of academia, civil society, diplomacy, and industry. And they met in uh, Rome, hence the name, the Club of Rome. Uh, they published a series of reports 
which really were dynamite reports. The first was called the limits to growth. The limits to growth, oh my God, which presented a dismal picture of the future of humanity on the, the planet, given the nature of the, the problems. Um, the problems that the Club of Rome focused on in that first report were environmental deterioration, sounds a little bit like today, poverty, which is a continuing issue today, endemic ill health, which in a country like the US, despite our wealth, is a major issue, urban blight and criminality. So these are all major themes that the Club of uh, Rome in that first report took on. The significance of that from a social indicator's point of view is that the assumption was made, and I think correctly, that you could not look at developments in one field or failures in one field without looking at developments and failures in the other fields, that you needed to bring these things together. They all needed to be looked at at the same time. And you can see in that conceptualization, the need then for index, indexing of these uh, indicators in some way, so that you get a much broader perspective on a, a whole range of things working together. Um, Petchy's work was laid out in a document that was later written by uh, Azbekan. Uh, I know Joe knew Hassan Azbekan. Uh, Eric Jantz, Alexander Christakis, um, and they, they created the proposal for what was to become the limits of growth. Now, Janella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, Jurgen Randers, and William Behrens are the people who authored that report. That report was subsequently published in 30 different languages, and it sold 30 million copies within, I would say, five years of its release. Just to give you uh, some illustration of the hunger that people had for understanding the broad social forces and economic forces that were going on around them and what the implications would mean for the future. There was just tremendous interest and enthusiasm in it. But the downside was, of course, it painted such a, a negative picture of the thing, uh, of our situation. Uh, Petchy himself decided to call this integration of uh, analyses in these areas as the human problematique. Uh, that's what's, that concept is what has stayed with uh, the Club of Rome. They published a second report. This was called Mankind at the Turning Point, 1974. Again, a very uplifting title, isn't it? Mankind at the Turning Point. And this was done, uh, written by Edward Pastel and Mikhailo Mezarovich of Case Western Reserve University. And they did what they did um, was to use more than 200,000 equations in building their model, compared with the club, the first one, the limits of growth, which used a thousand equations. I know that'll put everybody to sleep, but it just goes to uh, give you some sense of the complexity of a model building that was taking place at that time. Uh, Kelsey, how am I doing on time? You've been exactly 30 minutes since we started. Um, so I would say approximately 25 to 30 minutes left because we started a couple of minutes late. Well, that, yes, I don't want to interrupt Joe's. I don't want to interfere with Joe's. So One 25 to th yeah. Club of Rome is um, called the reshaping of the international order, referred to generally as Rio, uh, 1977. This was prepared by John Tinbergen, a Dutch economist, Nobel laureate. You can see these are all very prominent people uh, in the world community of research. And they provide a somewhat less integrated model than the first two, but nonetheless emphasize the importance of social indicator, social reporting, and, and model building in the involvement of public leaders and influencing public policy on the part of academics who are doing this uh, research, the close relationship that needed to exist between them. And I think, Joe, this is where I'll stop. I'm going to let you continue from here because I don't want to, you have things that you need to cover as well. So I'll stop here. And I'll be glad to answer more questions. I'll be glad to deal with more content in the Q&A. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, this is a kind of a nice uh, uh, narrative of uh, some of the early stuff. Um, 
the um, the rest of the the presentation will be focused on some of the publications that are listed here. Um, and and for those of you who might be interested in uh, in in getting those slides because there are a lot of references in the back, you know, and if you're interested in 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 the history of and systems of um, of the social indicators movement, the quality of life metrics, um, uh, and what we're calling nowadays uh, well-being research, um, then again these references and citations may uh, may help you. Uh, better understand uh, the the movement or the field of study we call social indicators and quality of life metrics. Okay, um, let me uh, say something about how I'm organizing things, and I, you know, much of the things that I may be talking about all sort of overlaps with what Richard uh, has already um, talked about. Um, I'm going to break things down in terms of. That you know the 1960s versus um, and the pre 1960s, and we're gonna go into the 1970s and the 80s and the 90s and the and and the early 2000s. I'm not gonna go over 2010 because that's so much research that has been um, that has been sort of chronicled in uh, after 9, 2010, and, and 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 it's gonna take another historian to to kind of capture. Uh, all of that. But so I'm going to stop just around 2010. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I break things down in terms of social indicators and quality of life research in sociology, economics, and political science versus health and medicine, and then management, because these are essentially three different areas of research that have sort of blossomed over the years that, that, that have to be treated uh, sort of somewhat independently because there's so much that have been done in those in the context of those different disciplines. Um, so let me start out with the 1960s and the pre-1960s and, and, and some of the stuff um, um, Richard has already alluded to, the social survey and charity organization movements of the 1900s um, the um, the recent social trends, which which is essentially some of the early publication by uh, William Ogburn uh, and his colleagues from the University of Chicago, uh, that should uh, definitely be mentioned. Uh, they 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 provided a foundation of what we call the theory of measurement of social change. Then we have the work of Howard Odom. Uh, in the United States, where they documented social indicators in the southern regions of the United States, and that that work came from the University of North Carolina. Um, in the 1960s, um, there is the Hoover Committee on Social Trends, and as Richard mentioned, he something about the Johnson administration. The Johnson administration developed what we call this the Great Society program that literally provided uh, the impetus of much of the social indicators uh, in the United States. Then again, we have some of the early works, 1966, we've got Raymond Bauer, Social Indicators. This is a classic, a classic uh, publication that again provided the foundation for the social indicators movement, at least the modern movement. Uh, the Daniel Bell, again, um, uh, toward a social report, uh, the Donowski and Wolf, the level of living index, um, um, Wilbur Cohen, social indicator statistics of public policy. All of these are classic, classic, again, publications that provided the foundation of the social indicators movement. Uh, we have the, 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 a, a report that came out of the, the United States Department of Health and Education and Welfare in 1969 that also is highly cited and is considered to be a classic. Uh, Moncor Olson, 1969, Social Indicators and Social Accounts. Again, a very classic uh, publication that provided, again, much of the foundation for, for the, the modern movement. Um, it, all of that was very much based on what you call objective indicators, objective subject, uh, objective indicators uh, of, of quality of life. Then we have Norman Bradburn. Now, in his book, and it's a classic book, which is the structure of psychological well-being, uh, started 
providing the foundation of what we call the subjective well-being. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, and for those of you who might be familiar with some of his uh, Bradburn's work, uh, he produced what we call the affect uh, balance scale that is very, very widely cited in, in the subjective well-being uh, research area. Um, then, now that's, that's in sociology, uh, economics, and, 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 and political science, and, and so forth. In the context of health and medicine, we have the World, um, uh, the world Health Organization. They, pro they essentially, in 1948, they developed the constitution of WHO. Uh, and in that constitution, they talked about how health has to be ingrained in, in the sort of the social environment. And, 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 and the social environment has to be taken into account in defining, defining the concept of wealth. Um, uh, the uh, Halbert Dunn in 1959, high level of wellness for man and society, again, under uh, underscored the concept of how health is highly intertwined uh, with, uh, with the social environment. You can't talk about health without talking about the context, and the context is the, 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 the social environment, as of course, the physical environment too. Um, but, the, you know, 1959, that again is a classic study that, a lot, that is highly cited in, uh, in health and medicine. Now, in the context of the elderly, we have uh, the work of Bernice Newgarten in 1961. Uh, she and, and, uh, and, and, and her colleagues developed this, this wonderful scale that is, as, as of today, it's still highly cited and it's used in the measurement of life satisfaction for the elderly in the context of health. Um, and again, we have Mary Wiley in 1970, life satisfaction as a program criteria uh, is you cannot, when once you have a health pr program, the, the way you evaluate that program is by looking at health indicators. Um, in management, the Hawthorne experiment, 1933, underscored the idea that once you pay attention uh, to uh, employees and workers in the context of the organization, they do better. <laughs> and that was demonstrated by a series of experiments that dates back in 1933. Chris Argus is the person uh, that in 1957 developed the concept of how an employee's personality, uh, if it fits the organizational culture, then that person produces more. Um, uh, and, and, and that, in essence, was the, the foundation of, um, of bringing in social indicators and quality of life metrics in the context of management. Then in 1960, Douglas McGregor uh, developed what we call Theory Y, which is opposed to Theory X, and that is much of much of the research in management has so focused on uh, on what we call uh, human factor engineering. Human factor engineering. What do we do in order to get the employee or the worker to produce the highest level possible? Um, Douglas McGrath came back and says, "Wait a minute. It's it's not about just uh, uh, if you want to focus on productivity, you also have to." Uh, bring in the human relations aspect. You have to consider the, um, you know, things, uh, constructs such as job satisfaction. It's job satisfaction makes a whole lot of difference in terms of employee productivity. Um, going back into the 70s and the 80s, and if you go back to psychology, uh, uh, psychology, sociology, economics, and political science, versus the other ones, such as health and medicine and measure. Let's start out with that. Um, there's so much that has been reported or, or, or at least chronicled um, uh, in the 70s. Like, for example, the, 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 the United States Office of Management and Budget and the United States uh, Bureau of Census, they uh, did so much in the, of the early work of so in social indicators. And of course, 
uh, Richard talk about the club of Rome and the limits of growth. Again, that was so foundational in the sense that it, 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 it allowed us to understand the, the dynamic between the environment and population demographics. Um, uh, and then we have the first large scale social survey uh, was, uh, was produced by the National Opinion Research Center in 1972, which is the general social survey. Until now, again, people use the data from, from this survey. Again, it, it, it was initiated back in 1972. Um, in 1974, Alex Michalos um, uh, established the, the, you know, the, 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 the prominent journal in our field, which is social indicators research. Um, in the, the 1979, we have the United Nations develop um, uh, reports on social and economic indicators. That was sort of the earliest work of the United Nations. Now, around the same time, the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, uh, we call it the OECD, of course, started issuing reports based on social indicators. The Statistical, Statistical Commission of the United Nations and the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, we call it UNESCO, started issuing social reports based on social indicators all the way back in again in the in the 70s. Um, many government reports started issuing country specific reports. Again, that we've seen uh, the reports from France, from Germany, from Sweden, from uh, the UK. Again, those are essentially based on social indicators. Continuing on, again, Richard mentioned the work of uh, Donald uh, McGranahan and his colleagues on content and measurement of socioeconomic development. Again, this is foundational work and, and, and classic publications in, uh, in the social indicators field. Um, Richard Easterlin, of course, some, many of you in, in, in economics know about his early work uh, and his early publication, Does Economic Growth Improve the Human Lot? Uh, accompanied by Otis Duncan, does money buy satisfaction? And, and that sort of um, um, uh, de uh, generated what we call the, the Easterlin paradox in, in happiness economics. Um, and again, that was foundational, very classic works in, uh, in social indicators and quality of life uh, movement and happiness economics. Now, again, um, uh, Richard mentioned the work of Andrew Withy, Andrews and Withy, and, and Campbell, Converse, and Rogers. Uh, these were based on subjective indicators, subjective indicators of quality of life. And for those who are familiar with, uh, it spurred the, the, the whole movement of subjective well being. Uh, much of the movement of subjective well being is based on the theory of what we call. Um, um, uh, bottom up spillover, bottom up, or what we call the satisfaction hierarchy. And the satisfaction hierarchy is that we feel satisfied uh, um, in, in, in the context of certain life events that kind of feeds into satisfaction in certain life domain. We call them domain satisfaction, and domain satisfaction ultimately spills over in a vertical fashion. Uh, to influence what we call life satisfaction, satisfaction hierarchy, a bottom up spill over kind of a process. And this theory, what we call, again, satisfaction hierarchy has been uh, developed or at least founded by Andrews and Withy and, and, and Campbell Converse and, and Rogers in these two publications, highly, highly cited in in uh, in subjective well-being um, uh, research, and then we have uh, again research that is also foundational in 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 the measurement of poverty. Uh, Morris David Morris, uh, with his uh, scale on uh, measuring conditions of world's poor, it's a, essentially a poverty scale, is also foundational in the social indicators movement. Um, other kinds of uh, uh, classic uh, studies and publication is Streeton, 
the first things first, meeting basic human needs. And again, this publication provided the foundation of what we call basic human uh, human needs theory, and, and much of the poverty literature and social indicators have been built on this on this particular uh, publication. Many of you also are familiar with Ruth Van Hoven and his and his huge uh, uh, magnanimous attempt in developing the world data base of happiness. Um, um, at Diener uh, in his uh, his 1994 publication on a subjective well-being in the psychological bulletin has been widely, widely cited all over the place. Uh, and again, Ed Diener is supposed to be the sort of the founding father of the subjective well-being research in, in the context of quality of life metrics. Alex Michalos in his theory of multiple discrepancy theories. Again, this is a foundational theory, a classic theory that a lot of people have built on. And the idea there is that when you make a judgment about your life satisfaction, you can do it in, in a sort of in, in a vacuum, yet you do it in the context of standard of comparison. So you evaluate your life, how, how, how well uh, your life is as a function of uh, comparing your life with significant others, uh, comparing your life with with your past accomplishments, comparing your life with you with your uh, predictive expectations in terms of what you should be uh, accomplishing uh, in the future, that kind of thing. Again, a, a very foundational theory uh, uh, of subjective well-being. Richard Estes <laughs> and his. Uh, and his um, um, work on, on the index of social progress uh, has used, again, uh, 50 years of data uh, to document, based on objective measures, uh, again, uh, the quality of life of, of different nations. And this has sort of been documented in trends in social development. And again, a very classic, uh, a very classic study. At that time, back in, in, in the 80s, we had the working group of, on social indicators, so they call it the RC55 of the International Sociological Association that was created back then. In health and medicine, you know, it, it, an early concept that is, again, foundational to the whole field of what we call health-related quality of life is quality, quality. The quality is the idea that when you when you develop a medical treatment, uh, uh, then you can't just focus on prolonging life. You have to take into account the quality of life. So when you're saying I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm producing some sort of a therapy, a, a, a medical intervention of sorts, you have to take into account not just prolonging life, but prolonging the quality of life of the patient. And this is where quality came in and literally became so foundational in the health-related quality of life movement. Um, and then, in, and again, in the 70s, the, the United States National Center for Health Statistics introduced self-related health uh, survey questions. And that was the first time you know, back in the 70s where understanding how people assess their own health is a very important factor in in health metrics, health metrics. In management and marketing, uh, again, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, you know, there was a whole program of research on, on, on the relationship between job satisfaction and life satisfaction. It's not only important to generate job satisfaction because job satisfaction has been demonstrated to affect employee productivity and job performance, uh, but also the the life satisfaction, life satisfaction of the employee, employee well-being, and therefore a whole program of research has been generated to try and understand how job satisfaction spills over on life satisfaction. What are those moderators? What are those mediators? What are those antecedents? So again, a whole program of research that assess that is based on the relationship between job satisfaction and life satisfaction. And also in that, in that air, uh, arena, we had so much research on work-life balance 
the psychology of spillover, segmentation, compensation, how people kind of manage uh, their work lives and their non-work lives and, and how they create balance in their life that ultimately affects their life satisfaction. The American uh, Marketing Association uh, uh, conducted early workshops on social indicators back in 1971, and that kind of spurred a whole bunch of conferences in marketing um, uh, that generated all kinds of special issues in a program research in marketing on how do you how do you bring, how do you provide the impetus to organizations in the context of marketing to develop products and services that would not only generate customer satisfaction, but also enhance the uh, enhanced life satisfaction of those people that consume those products and services. Um, then we get into the 90s and, and the 2000s, the early 2000s. Uh, we have a whole bunch of things that happen. They are very exciting stuff. Uh, the social indicators uh, and, and social reporting movement uh, have been recognized uh, by Western government and some of the classic work by Heinz Herbert Knoll and, and Wolfgang Zatz. Uh, again, that classic publication in 1994. And again, the references are all the way back in the re in, 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 at the end of uh, this presentation. Um, in 1995, uh, we created the International Society of Quality of Life Studies, ISCOLS uh, for short, uh, and, and, it's, um, and later on after in, in 2006, uh, we had the flagship um, journal, which is uh, Applied Research and Quality of Life, we call it ARCLE, and its first volume was, was published in, in 2006, and, and the founding uh, editors, essentially it was Richard Estes, Alex Mikolos, and myself. Um, Ed Diener uh, developed 1995 the value-based index of national quality of life. Again, a, a very classic, uh, um, uh, a very classic measure of quality of life that has sort of been embedded in, in, in the subjective well-being movement uh, to the national level, to the national level. The genuine progress indicator uh, uh, that that was established by the Redefining Progress, which is an organization, is the sort of the the, the countermeasure of GDP. Uh, GDP, as developed by the economists, has said, well, it doesn't really take into account, you know, these negative externalities. We need to take into account those negative externalities and the rede redefining progress. Uh, develop the genuine progress in indicator. Um, uh, uh, to counter the, the, all those traditional measures of GDP. Um, social indicators research. No, no, besides social indicators research, we, Alex Mikolos you know, founded uh, a whole book series on social indicators and quality of life metrics, uh, which was published by Plur Academic Publishers uh, now merged into, well, actually became Springer. Um, that was back in 1997, and, and that book series blossomed into, my goodness, if Alex, he, I wonder if Alex, is he, he may be able to talk about that, but that is, there are so many volumes in it, and, and that, again, um, was, uh, was foundational, foundational in so many ways. Um, again, Estes weighted index of social progress is classic, and his uh, and, and and his book on 1998 uh, that has documented much of that research uh, uh, using the uh, the weighted index of social progress uh, is is also a classic. Another classic is by Meringoff, and Meringoff is the Fort the Fordham index of social progress. Again, a classic in 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 social indicators research. Then in 2000, uh, the Journal of Happiness Studies uh, was first published. And, and again, the founding fathers, uh, the founding editors, I mean, uh, Ruud van Hoven, Ed Diener, and, and Alex Mikolos. Uh, this journal is again, uh, is um, uh, a very important journal in our field. Uh, we have uh, the work by Ken Land and his colleagues on the Child Wellbeing Index. 
uh, that is also foundational, especially in the context of not only social indicators at large, but the child indicators movement. Um, then we have several uh, 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 white papers uh, that has been sort of sponsored by ISCOLs, one of them um, on national indices and evaluating all those national indices from, for example, the Human Development Index to you name it. That, again, that was done by Haggerty and, and a bunch of other colleagues in a 2001 publication. And, and of course, mo most of you are familiar with the Human Development Index, the HDI, and then, of course, the Gender Related Development Index and the Gender Empowerment Measurement Index, all by the United Nations Development Program. Again, these are foundational and so much that has sort of um, uh, generated so much research from, from this kind of data and, and these types of indicators. Then from that, we have, my goodness, multitudes, multitudes of social surveys, large scale sur social surveys uh, from the Euro Barometer, the European Value sur Survey, the European Social Survey, the European Community Household Panel Study, the European Quality of Life Survey, the Korea Barometer Surveys, the United States General Social Survey, the Russian Longitudinal Monitoring Survey, the Latino Barometer, the Survey of Living Conditions in the Arctic, the Australian Unity Wellbeing Index, the Afro... <laughs> I'm, run, I'm running out of steam here. Uh, on and on, you know, the Asia Barometer 2, the Jesus um, Social Weather Station and, and their social reports in the Philippines, all of that, you know, were developed in, uh, in the, the 1990s. And then we had, um, again, uh, many, uh, uh, well, nonprofit NGOs developed uh, some very specific indicators that have became so prominent in, in also in, in the social indicators field and quality of life metrics. Amnesty International, the Freedom House, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and Transparency International, the Center for Disease Control, the African Development Bank, the OECD, the Asian Development Bank, Bank the Inter-American uh, uh, Development Bank, all those have developed some very specific uh, uh, indicators, uh, social indicators and country specific indicators and regional indicators. Yeah. Uh, could we just check with Kelsey? Oh, this is Richard. Uh, could we just check with Kelsey on time so that we have question and answers? Right. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I'm gonna try and wrap it up uh, as okay. quickly as possible. Uh, just another few minutes. Uh, then in the context of planning, uh, we have community indicators projects. And again, all over the, the world, uh, from the United States and Canada and, and Europe, we had what we call community indicators project at the city level. Uh, we had a surge of these. Um, we had conferences on community indicators research that was sponsored by ISCOLs uh, that also uh, uh, spun the... Uh, Community Indica Indicators Consortium, if you're familiar with that, that is a, a, a very um, important uh, uh, organization, a professional organization for those people who do this kind of social indicators research. And then we had book series on community indicators, uh, and then we have other kinds of things like from the United, United Way of America, the State of Caring Index and the kids uh, count initiative of the NEE Casey Foundation. Again, this is very important work for those people who are involved in community indicators research. Uh, health and medicine, this is when in 1995 we have the, we have um, uh, again the International Society of Quality of Life Research, which is the sister organization of ISCOLs, but focusing strictly on health related uh, issues of quality of life was established back in 1995 and, and, and its flagship journal, which is Quality of Life Research was established then. And we have a lot of good work that came out of WHO, the World Health Organization, and they, they came up with a health-related uh, uh, quality of life measure that, again, has been used 
a lot in health related quality of life research. Then so many instruments have been developed in the context of the health related quality of life uh, that are what we call disease specific. So we have quality of life measures related to diabetes for those people who are afflicted by diabetes, cancer, um, uh, unit respiratory disease, you know, um, 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 on and on, on and on. It's just unbelievable amount of research and instrumentation that came out of this, uh, this, this health related quality of life. Then we have a whole bunch of stuff that came out of management and marketing, uh, uh, especially in the context of work-life balance, employee well-being, and 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 the the concept of quality of life has has been sort of now embedded in the context of marketing as how organizations can can. Uh, uh, can manage themselves, not just to satisfy customers, but also to enhance consumer well-being. Uh, so much of that has been very well established in the 90s and, and the early 2000s. And this is it. <laughs> I did run out of steam. Um, so I'm going to um, leave some room for questions and answers. Um, and so this is what we talked about, Richard and I. Um, and we have a whole bunch of references for those people who want to use those references. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, now we can turn it on to, again, the Q&A session. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joe. Uh, maybe, could you go back one slide just so it's on the screen slightly longer um, so people can reference back to the, uh, to see a reference list. Um, yeah, and then what they'll they'll be able to go to the recording and then find it there. Uh, all right. So, did you understand? Yeah. So I think that this works better. Yeah. So this. Thank you. You can. Uh, I think now you can unshare if you'd like, and uh, we will open it up to Q and A. So uh, anyone who has a question, please raise your virtual hand, um, and then what we'll do is we'll you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question, or you can write in the chat and I can read it out for you. Um, as uh, I think questions come in, I, I have a question for you, um, Richard, just to get started. You mentioned that there were these development decades in the United Nations and that they determined that, you know, while growth, there was growth, there was economic development, there was not an improvement in quality of life. How did they determine that, that there was not an improvement in quality of life? It was the maldistribution of wealth that took place, that uh, wealth was generated, but it continued to be concentrated among the top 5% of the population. So uh, government officials, uh, military, those that really controlled the society took a disproportionate share of what was available. There were some cases where checks would be, or credits would be issued to countries and they would just disappear someplace. Um, but they didn't go to improve plumbing or toiletry, toilets or um, housing or general health care and so on of the population. Uh, so the problem is not strictly economics. The problem is the distribution of the economics within the system, the maldistribution of it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nuno, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. You can uh, ask a question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful to hear you. It's just a, a simple, but I think very complex question, I believe. Uh, what do you think are the, the main challenges of today for social indicators? What are today the main for continuing this uh, wonderful work that has been done since the past? Thank you. Richard? Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted here uh, by something. Um, but you were asking about the contemporary implications of the past. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. I think it's been a continuum through the decades um, about social indicators that the interest has been to provide some objective and now subjective measures that we could measure over time 
and see what changes are taking place in relation to it. The theme has been the same. Uh, the part that I was very impressed with Joe's is that he showed the different levels of analysis that were taking place in terms of individuals, how they felt and experienced their well-being. Then he moved to community, he moved to larger collectivities, even to the global level, many of the reports that he, he showed. The questions always remain the same, but asked at the appropriate level of analysis. Does that make sense? Yes. I, I think what the reason that I referred back to the uh, survey journal is that when I read some of the um, title pages to the uh, publication, I was just sort of shocked. I was shocked by uh, the similarities of those papers and concerns to what it is we're concerned with today. Uh, for example, the integration in the United States, of course, it's the integration of people from diverse cultures into a common society, such that you have an American society, not this hyphenated type societies. Well, of course, this is a, an enormous issue for Europeans as well. Um, and it's an issue for uh, Latin America as people are moving from uh, one country to another within that hemisphere. How do you maintain the centrality of your cultural identity and values at the same time that you need these people to come in for economic purposes? Is the aging of the population and the small fertility rates have required uh, European countries to, quote, import large numbers of people from other cultures, but they are bringing those cultures with them. How do you make that all work together into a common fabric? That's a that's a real challenge. That was the same challenge in the 1910s. Uh, I I can also uh, say something about that. Um, I believe that the ultimate dependent variable in the social behavioral policy sciences is well-being, is quality of life. Um, our field of study, it is not a discipline yet. I would love, I mean, my hope, our hope is to turn, essentially our challenge is to turn the field of study into an academic discipline. An academic discipline meaning, you know, academic disciplines like psychology, like economics, like uh, political science, like sociology. These are academic disciplines. Uh, now, I'm thinking in terms of neuroscience. Neuroscience is a sort of a newly academic discipline. It is an amalgam of, of other types of disciplines, but actually sub-disciplines in, in the context of these other disciplines from psychology to computer science to computer engineering to communications um, um, and on and on. Neuroscience now is a sort of a blossoming discipline. Uh, it's just amazing that when, when they hold conferences and that is, they're not conferences, they're conventions, and they take over cities uh, when, they, when, they, uh, when they convene and, and, and do these conferences. I, our hope is to become a, something like neuroscience. It's, it, it would be quality of life and well-being as a discipline, every university should have a department uh, of well-being, a department of quality of life, because it is the ultimate dependent variable um, uh, that most disciplines should focus on and should 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 use to 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 uh, conceptualize and measure, uh, you know. The, the, the thing that is most important at different levels of analysis, at the individual level, at the community level, at the national level, at the, at the international level. That is the challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So next question is from Clifford Schultz. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks um, uh, for terrific presentations. Um, enjoyed them very Let's much. Turn on your yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for terrific presentations. I enjoyed them very much, as I know the others did as well. Joe, my question or comment 
coincidentally builds on much of what you just said. And, and the observation is, if you could speak, you and or Richard could speak to the matter of the dynamics of complex marketing systems, the extents to which they fail or succeed, and the implications um, for quality of life in the moment and societal and even global well-being over time, because I think we all share some interest in that particular space sure. and the opportunities that emerge in it. Joe, that's for you. As I hear marketing, I know it's Joe's question. Yeah. Some of the, um, you know, the marketing has positive and negative externalities. Um, the way we have marketing systems and the way those marketing systems operate, whether in capital in, in capitalist um, countries uh, or socialist countries, again, they, there are positive and negative externalities. Mm -hmm. it, we need to capture those externalities in a very systematic and methodical way. Um, and the 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 science of social indicators quality of life again provides us with the kind of ammunition that allows us to again capture those positive and negative externalities um and and therefore that field of study has so much to offer to the marketing discipline uh and marketing systems um and economic systems of all kinds <laughs> um, that's the sort of the brief answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. If I may, just uh, uh, sorry, Tiffany, uh, just to piggyback on this, and you're, you're up next. Uh, Joe and, and Richard both, if I heard the question correctly, part of it is uh, there's a distinction between quality of life today and quality of life going forward. Uh, you know, how do we balance that? Uh, you know, and, and potentially how do we measure it? Uh, or, or let's say a set of policy target, including both aspects. Well, Kelsey, you, you weighed in, in in a timely way. I, I would like to say, or maybe rephrase that as the the peril of social traps in the short short run that might make us have a high quality of life for the moment, but at great cost to the quality of life and societal and global well being going forward. Cliff, I actually like to turn this around to you and ask you what would be your answer to those questions. You're, you're, you have great knowledge about this. How much time do you have, Richard? Uh, well, you have a couple of minutes, like everyone else. Well, I, so I, I, that. I, 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 on a more serious note, I, I, I do, and I know some of my colleagues here spend a lot of time exploring social traps and commons dilemmas, right. and uh, market-based solutions that interact with policy um, to affect well-being in the short run and to provide incentives to people. Uh, to prosper in the long run along with the rest of us rather than um, succumbing to those social traps in the short run, whether it's the classic commons dilemma in the neighborhood about sustaining a small forest or, or a pond or the global commons that we share that's being uh, damaged by war and plastics pollution and those kinds of things. So, um, of course, we call this macro marketing and we believe that it offers quite a bit of promise across disciplines, because everything ultimately, in my view, and I think the data would support this, is affected by what happens in the marketplace as we've been marketing animals for, since we climbed from the primal ooze. So if we can get that right, we can deliver a mix of good services and experiences with proper um, uh, legislation um, to, I think, make this a better world and to enhance well-being for everyone. Well said. Uh, I would like to respond, but I'll do this uh, at the end. So, uh, Tiffany, uh, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, ask your question. Hi. Well, I first just want to say thanks for this really useful um, historical overview. Where are you? Um, Where are you, I, see you. Can you see me? Oh, I'm not seeing you. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, so, yeah, so I, I just was thanking you all for this really useful historical overview. Um, I, I understand myself as an interdisciplinary researcher, so I thought it was so interesting how through the history, history you all really like broke it apart into like, you know, social sciences, uh, health and medicine, especially. Um, and I think just kind of going to this point, Joe, that you were bringing up earlier, I really wanted to hear you all's thoughts 
on the potential value, if any, of you know continuing this this social indicators research in these distinct disciplines? Or you know, I mean, like I said, Joe, your comment about well-being as a discipline of its own maybe started to answer my question, but I'm just wondering if you all can maybe speak to the potential value of, you know, continuing to explore well-being in these distinct disciplinary areas. I believe that that we have an obligation as scientists, uh, as well-being scientists, quality of life researchers, to, in, in the context of our own discipline, to not only embrace but advocate you know these concepts that come from our field of study uh, and advocate those concepts and those measures in a way that they would become mainstream once they become mainstream in their in in those different disciplines the, the already established disciplines then we have a chance to be able to bring together, just in the same way that neuroscientists have done, bring together those sub-disciplines. So from a field of study to a, a sub-discipline to a discipline, bringing all those sub-disciplines together under one roof, under one umbrella, we call it the science of well-being, and being able to establish curricula, academic departments, um, you know, uh, our own discipline. Yeah, there we go. Our discipline. That That is my true hope and dream. But I don't think I'm going to see it in my lifetime. My, my view is that um, it is the goal in the end that we have a separate discipline that can uh, focus on the issues that we're concerned with. It's not going to happen in my lifetime for sure. But at the same time, I don't want to sacrifice the depth and richness of the individual disciplines, because that's what makes the social indicator research field so uh, fertile for the kinds of research we're doing. I don't want to dilute the economic piece. I don't want to dilute the social welfare component of it or the health piece. Health piece is very secure. We have a whole organization and journals and endless publications dealing with the quality of life and patient satisfaction and so on. I think that's a very secure area. But transportation, this country we're dealing with right now, the uh, 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 public transport airplane industry and crashes and things that are taking place. We're dealing with infrastructure in terms of bridges that are failing. Um, that's an area that I think we, we can contribute a lot to along with the engineering sciences and technology sciences, we can help inform um, the kinds of uh, issues that they're working on. But I, I think the uh, Joe's idea is something that will take a long time to develop, but we have to be very careful that we do not give up the richness of the disciplinary backgrounds that we already have. And that, that's the hard part. I know when I did my doctoral work, I concentrated in five areas. I had the craziest, doctoral committee, and that's a long time ago, but that was Berkeley and it was possible in those days. Thank you. So we have a question, a couple of questions in the chat. So Tithi asks, uh, first says thank you, and then uh, asks, you know, given that societies and cultures differ, should we or would we be able to come up with a social development index, um, you know, kind of in contrast to a human development index, and I, I just asked her to clarify, and, and Titi, feel free to unmute yourself uh, if you'd like to clarify. She uh, specified, though, that social development to her is um, you know, something broader. It incorporates, uh, let's say, how humans operate and flourish. Uh, so maybe you can specify an indicator that already exists to this extent. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. That's all right, Kelsey. Yeah. Um, that's something that I've done quite a lot of. I've been invited by governments of a number of societies to help develop their, uh, what they call information systems, but they really mean are systems, social indicators and models that they can use to inform their policies and so on. It's very unique to their society. So that with Hong Kong, uh, we developed the Hong Kong index of uh, social development, so, uh, social progress, and we measured um, 
the situation in Hong Kong from the beginning of Hong Kong as a colony through to the um, return of Hong Kong to mainland China. With, and we set in place the technology for where they could continue to monitor the impact of the, um, what they call the takeover, but in any case, I call the reabsorption into the mainland uh, and what impact that would have on their society, which is a democratic society. Um, but it's a very, it's different from my general index of uh, social progress. I've done the same thing in mainland China uh, and in other countries. And always they've had to be tailored to the specific cultural identities of the, the countries. That's really where the issue is. It's not health or economics, um, because we, we know what we're going to come up with in those areas. But it's the cultural pieces and how you build them into the appropriate sub-indexes that make up the, the larger, more complex integrated model. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Gilsey, can I address your question, uh, your uh, comment about the future? Um, just giving it some thought, and and what I came up with is that our field of study has to be integrated with another field of study. Actually, it's more than a field of study; it could be a discipline by now. Futuristic studies. There is a growing field of uh, futuristic studies that is based on the science of forecasting. Uh -huh. So if, if we focus on the future, then we need to translate much of our views and translate much of our indicators and data uh, using forecasting models, forecasting techniques to try and project what the future will be like. And if we'd be able to do a good job forecasting using social indicators, we may be able to, again, better advise policymakers to create the, those kinds of policies that would mitigate, you know, the negative externalities and, and propagate the positive ones. Very helpful. Um, is there like a canonical text? For uh, or maybe um, author for these uh, this discipline. Uh, I will tell you if you look at the um, book publication series that Joe's the ed senior editor for, and I sort of contribute to it uh, on social policy and public policy, social development, social indicators, and public policy. Uh, we now have Joe what twenty volumes in that series. Yep. You will certainly see exactly what it is. The last chapter of every book deals with the future. Hmm. And uh, the authors do the descriptive work of what was and what could be. But then in the last chapter, they're asked to make uh, recommendations about the future, what can be to maximize or optimize, I should say, what is a society can achieve for uh, their citizens. So that's one place to go, and it's a very large body of work. Yeah. But, but it, you know, in terms of the science of forecasting, there's quite a bit of established work. So if, if people might be interested in, in pursuing this line of research, um, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. I'll provide you with good, some good references. Journal forecasting, for example. Yeah, that's right. That's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we have uh, two more questions and one minute left. So uh, I, I think you know probably we'll go you know a, a minute or two over, but let's see if we can just maybe address these last two uh, questions. So Francesco, uh, you know one of our, our co-organizers, asks um, he would like to know more about the factors that, uh, and this is really more coming from Joe's perspective, facilitate the penetration of social indicators into international institutions, um, such as in the 1990s and 2000s. And uh, he's thinking of the, uh, I think it's the GPI, the Gross Progress, uh, General Progress Indicator, and uh, HPI 2004 as examples. The political climate in every country makes quite a difference in the propagation of social indicators and quality of life metrics. Conservative, hawkish types of regimes do not favor social indicators. They focus so much on economic indicators. Once you have 
a change in regime and you end up with progressive governments, then those politicians provide the, the ammunition, the, uh, the fertile ground for the adoption of social indicators, quality of life metrics um, into the fold. They bring them into the fold. And I'm thinking in terms of, you know, what happened in the United States. Every time we have a democratic administration, we end up with some really good work at the federal level in terms of social indicators. Every time we end up with a conservative administration, you know, they, they, they decimate, <laughs> you know, our work on social indicators and quality of life measurement. The political climate makes up quite a difference. And, and, and this is kind of interesting when we see what's happening in Europe and, and the social democratic regimes that uh, have sort of um, grounded themselves in, 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 in many countries, although now we have, we have maybe a sort of a, a, a swing back of the pendulum. Um, uh, social indicators becoming much more popular in places like Europe than in North America because of the political climate. So that may be an answer to Francesca. I'll, I'll just uh, comment on it a little bit more if I might. The problem is social reports are dangerous for governments because it shows either success or failure of governments. And Richard Nixon, when he came into office, disbanded all efforts to create an integrated national social report system that is a state of the state type thing, because it was too problematic for them politically to see the, ch the negative changes in poverty and so on, despite so-called high levels of investment. Every time I went to China, what they would stamp on my visa was knowledge worker. Well, knowledge worker is a good thing in one sense. You show great respect to professors and so on. However, knowledge worker also meant that this is a guy to watch out for. <laughs> he was collecting information, he would share information and so on. So the deal was, and I, it was a good bargain that I struck with them, is I would not publish data from China, but I would help them create models where they could study the changing patterns of social provision within the large city states that make up China, which are larger than most European countries, I will add. Um, most of the cities are much larger. Um, and so we did that, but it remains confidential information, and that's fine. But we created the, the model for that. But the, the danger of uh, knowledge cannot be um, underestimated with respect to this field. That's why in the US we struggle so much. We had a whole series, as Joe was saying, we had Nixon, and Reagan, and Bush one, and Bush two, and Trump. I mean, God help us, uh, none of whom wanted accurate information to be reported. The information is there, you can get it, but it's in each of the departments, different reports, and the definitions aren't always the same, which is a better sort of a, the same indicator which is a, a way of keeping scholars from being able to put things together. So at this point, I'd just like to say thank you everyone who has lasted this long. So we are now over the time. We have uh, one last uh, question and I will, you know, feel free to, to, to leave it, you know, as you, as you wish everyone. And uh, maybe we can let you uh, finish Joe and Richard, if you're willing to uh, address this one. So it's, uh, <clears throat> there's a, a new book, uh, on the, it's called The New Science of Progress, advocated by Patrick Collison and Tyler Cowan. And um, so maybe you're not familiar with the book. If you are, that'd be great. If, uh, if not, you might uh, think of this, how this work and this history it relates to the new science of progress, uh, in quotes, right? So instead of a field on quality of life, social indicators, you could think of this as progress. Uh, and, and maybe, and we'll, I think we'll close on, uh, on, on these statements from you guys. Well, I would just say progress is the outcome. Indicators are descriptive of the process whereby you get to the outcome. So that we, we have to be very clear on, on that. So I, I like the concept that you just described. That, that is, in fact, the way the authors present it. Okay. Um.
<laughs> just to give it a sense of closure. Um, that the book that you're mentioning came to my attention. As a matter of fact, it's on my to purchase list. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as soon as I read it, I can respond a little bit more intelligently. <laughs> uh, but I'm planning to do that. Thanks, thanks for uh, bringing this up. There is, uh, just so you're aware, in the chat, there is a, a link from, it looks like an Atlantic article, uh, as well as a, uh, a New York Times article. So you may be able to get some additional information on the book there. Great, Great. yes, thank and, you. Uh, so That'd be my, my motivation to, to refer to it as progress is to uh, redefine progress as one of the groups was uh, named, uh, you know, that you have referenced in the, in the history. Uh, because the, let's say, the, 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 the typical approach right now, the default approach is looking at the economic measures. And so what you're providing are an alternative set of indicators. Mm -hmm. And so you might think of, uh, yeah, this, this uh, economics of happiness, science of happiness. Uh, science of quality of life or science of progress as being all um, interrelated. Uh, that's what I was thinking. Uh, but uh, I understand uh, the distinction that you've made between indicators and outcome, and I, I think you're, you're right. Uh, so you might alternatively call the field uh, or discipline that uh, Joe was referring to uh, instead as the, the science of progress. Oh, nice. I like that. Sounds cool. good. Well, okay, thank well, you, Kelsey, for putting this together. This was um, absolutely. very stimulating. Yeah, great. I, I, you had a, a lot of thanks in the chat as well. I so, have to see all the hands. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And so for everyone, we will be putting this up online uh, very soon. Uh, thank you again for attending. Uh, thank you, especially Joe and Richard. Okay. Thanks, thank again. you so much. Bye -bye. I don't know where the hand thing is, but I wanted to applaud my fellow people. <laughs> thank so. you very much. Thank you.